Isabel Fox and Duke is back for round two. Yes. Uh, <laughs> to say I'm excited about this episode is clearly an understatement. Oh my goodness. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. So I'm not going to lie. I mean, we had a great time last time. I remember it vividly. Yeah. Ah, which like, I imagine that you get asked to do a fair shake of podcasts so that you remember. This is definitely this is my compliment of the day right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, a, right. great, we had a great time. Let me tell these people who you are. Uh, so Isabel Fox and Duke. A graduate of Tufts University with a BA in sociology. She is also a certified health coach who's also studied Zen meditation, transpersonal psychology. She is the creator of stopfightingfood.com, which is essentially all that we talk about in the, not all that we talk about. We talked about a lot of stuff in the last episode. Um, so if you're a longtime fan of the show, you might recall episode 27. It is honestly one of my all time favorite episodes. Oh, show. no, I'm honored. You should. It is a great episode. Um, it was really fun. Okay. So now that we've talked about how great it is, uh, in that episode, we unpack binge eating, what we're taught about binge eating, and just how stupid and wrong it is. Uh, what we both know to be real, which is that if you don't eat or you don't eat enough or frequently enough or whatever, you're going to uncontrollably eat in response. And so binge eating is not this like deep, you are psychologically like, no, there's real physiological foundational yeah. things that happen. Um, so you don't have to go off and listen to that episode to enjoy this one. I'm just going to caveat that now, but if you want that information, it exists. And in the last year, Isabel has been a busy woman and she has been working on a cool, at least m- many cool things that I admire. But one of those things is founding the center for weight neutral coaching and it is that that act alone <laughs> was enough to bring her back in. We got a bunch of cool stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, Isabel, welcome back to Better Than Fine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here and very glad that you're taking an interest in a Center for Weight Neutral Coaching. I think that this is a, a key missing piece in the coaching industry is the weight neutrality part. So I'm very excited to talk about it. And not just coaching, also fitness and the wellness space and the health space and um, quick side tangent. I did an intake with a new GP today and regular listeners know, or sorry, I should say primary care physician. They're not called general practitioners anymore. Um, regular listeners know I'm not a small woman. And so going to a new doctor is always this like, oh, am I going to have to put this jerk in my place? And she was the most weight neutral body positive physician I have ever met. And the awesome. difference that that made. And then we had a conversation about how I'm like, I'm so glad that you are a, a teacher because other people need this thing you're doing. I was like, oh my God, if this exists in the world, like this is the thing we're all talking about trying to create. So, so it's good that people like you also exist uh, so that more people like her can exist. Oh, good. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's ex- now that I've just complimented you uh, up to both of us blushing for the listener's sake, why don't we unpack what is what is weight neutrality and why am I so damn excited about it? And, well, so, I mean, I think that it kind of goes without saying, right? We live in the opposite of a weight neutral society. The technical term for the opposite of weight neutral is weight normative, which basically means we live in a world that basically constantly sees body size through the lens of thin is good and fat is bad. Right. I mean, and you can apply this in all sorts of areas of life. Health wise, thin is good. Fat is bad. You know, appearance wise, thin is good. Fat is bad. Beauty thin is good. Fat is bad. I mean, that's just like the air that we're breathing constantly is thin is good. And fat is bad so much so that most people don't even think to question it, even though it's kind of a relatively new idea in the past. 150 years or so, something along those lines. Can I add a weird wrinkle to that? A thought that I have just had that as women, it's not even just thin, it's small. Yeah. I just had this thought of like, um, I've had Kelsey DeMello. She's a good friend. So she's been on the show a bunch and we talk a bunch about like training and weight and whatever. And And really at the core of it is this idea that like, fuck dieting and fuck weight management. Like we're glorifying smallness. And as women, that is like, even to the detriment of our health. Yeah. Um, do you, do you listen to maintenance phase? I'm gonna plug someone else's you podcast know, right now. I, I, I mean, it's incredible. I absolutely think Aubrey Gordon is like a genius and amazing. Yeah. She's one of the, I like guru, like current gurus of the space, as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, love Aubrey and everything that she does. 
Well, I, for the benefit of the listener, Maintenance Phase is my current podcast obsession. And their newest episode is essentially about the, like the history of why we fat shame and what's up with that bullshit. And I never realized this. Of course, it's super obvious listening to that episode that they talk about at a certain point of thinness, we see mortality go up. Like, of course, of course, even just a little bit below what we quote soft quotes call normal. Yeah. It's an inverted U. And so if we just keep glorifying smallness, like what are we doing to ourselves? I went on yeah. a tangent. I apologize. So anywho, yeah. so a weight normative society, which that those words yeah. in my mouth make me want to puke a little. Yeah. To be under what like the current BMI calls normal, which by the way, is a moving target that gets moved around politically all the time, right? Like our definition of normal BMI or healthy BMI is not, it's political. It changes. It changed in the nineties, you know, but to be under the current normal BMI is significantly more dangerous than anything above it could probably ever be. So yeah, like, um, that's a real thing that no one talks about because it's pretty rare that people get under because it's so fucking impossible to maintain these super, super thin weights. Right. So that's a whole other conversation, but if you were able to, it would be super fucking dangerous. Yeah. Sorry for the F bomb. Oh, fucking, fucking say the fucking fuck. Everybody who listens to the show knows that I love to curse. So please do. I I think I maybe hit that button a little harder than I normally do. Anyway. So So, weight weight neutrality. So we've got weight normative. Weight normative is like what we're doing now. It's thin is good. Fat is bad. It's basically seeing the world and looking at the world, looking at professionalism, looking at health, looking at beauty, looking at, you know, every aspect of life through the lens of thin is good and fat is bad, which is what most of us are just taught to do in our culture, you know, from birth. And we're all just swimming in that so much so that we don't even question it. Um, and you know, some people are starting to question it, thankfully, right. People like you and I, and growing numbers of people are going to be like, why do we do that? Is that actually useful? Is that actually helpful? Like, is it harmful? And turns out kind of is harmful, pretty harmful in a lot of ways, including in healthcare, which I think is something that people really don't realize at all. We were super brainwashed around thin is good for health and fat is bad for health, which I think we talked about maybe on the lost podcast and kind of dismantled that a little bit. I'm sure we'll get deeper into it, but so the concept of weight neutrality is like, let's just take away this moralization, this thin is good, fat is bad thing. And actually let's talk about, you know, like if I was going to run my healthcare practice in a weight neutral way, where I just focused on healthy behaviors for health's sake, without it being about making somebody thinner what would that look like? Right? Like what would it mean to approach health outside of the construct of trying to make somebody thinner as the pathway to health? Right. Would it be about sleeping more? Would it be about stress management? Would it be about eating more vegetables? What about be moving your body? I mean, there, you know, you can think about health in a million different ways or even Uh, making nutritional changes that have absolutely nothing to do with weight management, right? Like exactly, you can be otherwise perfectly healthy, but have been eating, I don't know, like I I think of the people out there doing a pure carnivore diet. Right. Sweetheart, your cholesterol is a bit high. I can't imagine why, like, let's get some vegetables in you. That has nothing to do with your weight. Right. And is far more dangerous from a health perspective than being- I, I don't, I don't even want to throw a number on it. Like let's, even if we use the garbage that is the BMI, I think most people walking around, most practitioners walking around don't even realize at such high thresholds, we see health consequences, like where that line even is. And so doing something extreme, like yo-yo dieting in ways that damage your metabolism cyclically Mm -hmm. is going to have a far more adverse effect on things like liver function, blood pressure. Fuck it. will give you gallstones. You're going to end up getting your gallbladder removed in a way that just staying the weight you were and, you know, getting a kick-ass wardrobe with that weight is probably healthier from a physiological perspective. But we're short in that conversation. Sure. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, you know, the sort of, um, you know, weight neutral perspective on health is pursuing health without pursuing weight loss as a proxy for health. 
right? So if I wasn't including making my square peg of a body fit into the round hole that society dictates for me, like if I was just taking weight loss off the table, if I was taking, trying to make my body look a certain way off the table as a pathway to health, what would health even mean? Right. What does, you know, and that's basically everything that's left. You could put technically into the category of weight neutral, right. Working on sleep, working on stress management, working on vegetable, all of those things are awesome for your health and have nothing to do with weight. And what we're learning is weight normative healthcare, where we use weight loss as a proxy for health, where we try to achieve health by trying to, you know, shove our square peg of a body into the round hole society dictates for us is super dangerous. It actually comes with a ton of side effects like you're talking about, right? Um, and weight neutral health is a lot uh, safer for most people. Um, I would argue probably for all people, yeah, but I would so, all people. Yeah, I'm just thinking of the number of clients that I have had tell me who actually I I had shared that story about my doctor this morning on Instagram and have invited people to like air their, you know, dirty socks about stupid triggering shit that doctors have done to them. So right now my like Instagram is just full of these stories, but times in which doctors have dismissed legitimate health concerns because that person is a bit, a bit heavier Uh and said, no, no, go lose weight and this will get better. And then that health consideration is left to fester. And in some cases resulting in hormonal imbalances that then cause more weight gain, cause a cycle to repeat. Oh, oh yeah. People literally tumors go undiagnosed in fat patients at a like disturbingly high rate because people will come and be like, oh, I have a pain right here. And the doctor say, well, if you lost weight, you wouldn't have a pain there. It's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with anything. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's ridiculous. I mean, I'm thinking of like hormone dysfunction and autoimmunity. So like people with thyroid dysfunction and then their thyroid just is like, well, I guess I'm done here. And now you're on medication. You're on taking Synthroid for the rest of your life. And the process of getting there caused such significant hormonal imbalances as to then result with other downstream effects because you looked at that you know, at the time, you know, a little bit off the norm scale person. Yeah. And we're like, you just need to lose weight. Shut up. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, unfortunately this is like a really common issue in medical care is just fat phobia and fat bias in medical care. Right. You know what I would come into a doctor's office and, you know, present with and get actual evidence-based medicine, you know, a larger bodied person might go in and they'll just be given a completely different prescription. They'll just be told to lose weight, which by the way, probably going to cause more harm than good in any circumstance. Um, and also misses the point of what actually might be going on with that person. So can yeah. you unpack your comment about why a physician prescribed like, well, just go lose some weight might cause harm. So the reality of the situation is that intentional attempts at weight loss are not proven to work long-term and have a long list of very widely researched and very like widely understood risks associated with them. When you go on a diet to treat a pretty much any kind of health condition, you are basically saying, I'm going to try taking this prescription that has a 95% chance of failure in two to three years. And I am willing to not only take this medicine with a 95% chance of failure, because, and when I say 95% chance of failure, what I mean is you're probably not going to be able to maintain that weight loss, right? 95% of people will gain their weight back, maybe even more of some for within two to three years of starting a diet. Diets are not sustainable. Intentional attempts of weight loss are not sustainable. We know this over and over and over again, study after study after study, the same conclusion, no matter what method of weight loss you're pursuing. So you have a 95% chance of failing at this prescription, right? Of this prescription, not working, not even doing its intended thing long-term. And then on top of that, you have a long list of side effects that are going to come along with that attempt at that prescription, right? So disordered eating, anxiety, metabolic issues. I mean, the list goes on and on hormonal imbalances. I mean, intentionally starving yourself has side effects who knew, right? So, and I think people, when I say that they get really sort of defensive of like, Oh, I'm not starving myself. I'm eating 1600 calories a day or, you know, whatever the case may be. But if your base metabolic rate is 2600 calories a day, you are starving yourself. If you are listening it. And by the way, by definition, if you're, you know, basically going into, if you're losing weight, you're probably you're in calorie deficit, 
by definition, you know, <laughs> like, um, I mean, I think like, you know, if there's, there's an argument to be said, if somebody had, you know, like a temporary weight gain and they lost it, that could be like a healthful rebalance. But for the most part, if you're a larger bodied person, you all of a sudden lose a bunch of weight. The only way to do that is to go into calorie deficit. Like scientifically speaking, like there's no healthy way to do that from an evidence-based perspective perspective. Yeah. So just to summarize, essentially what we're saying is like, the evidence on intentional weight loss through calorie restriction after an 18 month time horizon. So meaning if I start right now, a Mm -hmm. year and a half from now, I am statistically likely 95% of the time to be heavier than I was when I started. Yeah. I don't know if the 95% is in 18 months, but definitely within two to three years. I thought it was, um, which, whichever of these numbers, I, I don't think it depends within 18 which... months, you're probably at like 80%. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the percentages change all the time by definition, like, you know, that's specific, the longer you stay on a diet, the more, I think think of it as like flies dropping, right? Like dropping like flies, like the longer the diet goes, more participants in the study are going to drop yeah. until there's no one left. Yeah. And, you know, I always say like, at some point you're either going to binge, you're either going to rebel, or you're going to die. Like that's basically how it goes. Or just metabolically, you're you're shut you're down. Have been so stunted metabolically that everything you eat is, is not being metabolized properly. Um, if anybody wants the deep dive of like the hormonal and physiological mechanisms of this, go to the last time I had Kelsey DeMello on the show because we unpack. She's a chiropractor out of Houston, and we unpack all of these mechanisms as to why why does the body do that? And I, I personally refer to everything we just said as the big lie. Like that's the big lie of conventional fitness. That is the big lie of the weight loss industry is, oh, we know how to do it. You're just going to exercise and calorie restrict, and you're going to look so fucking hot. Like that's the big lie that is being Mm -hmm. sold to people who have also then been raised in this social stew that you're talking about of like, thinness is ideal and it's not just health, right? It's also interviews and speaking engagements and being an author and being on television and being like all of these positions that we glorify in society, we only put physiologically thin people into those roles, sometimes to the detriment of their own health. Yeah. And then we create this template that people feel like they have to aspire toward. Right. I mean, people talk about like, well, I want to lose weight for health reasons, but I mean, the vast majority of my clients, if like gun to their head, if you were like, be really honest about the reasons you're pursuing thinness, they would put avoiding weight stigma and acquiring thin privilege as way above my health, my long-term health effects as like the primary motivating factor for dieting, right? Like generally speaking, perhaps somebody may, you know, attempt dieting for quote unquote health reasons, if their doctor's putting pressure on them or whatever, but a good portion of people and I would say a higher rate of people are pursuing dieting for social reasons, right. Are pursuing dieting because they want to like not be disadvantaged in the world, right. And be treated with more respect or gain more power through the status symbol that is thinness, et cetera, et cetera. I think this brings up a paradox that I observe with mindful practitioners. And I will be curious of your thoughts. And the paradox is if that is what everyone has been conditioned to want, if you don't market to it, how do you market? Because, and, and I, I encounter, I have this argument with people I love and trust all the time who are out there actively pushing weight management, even though I know that it does not match their ideals because they believe that they cannot have a sustainable business in this space if they are not trying to sell that. So I would argue if you don't have anything interesting to sell other than weight loss, why are you in this business? Ooh, shots fired. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, why are you doing this? If the only thing you have to offer is preying on fat phobia, on the effects of fat phobia and oppression in this culture, if that's all you have to sell, get a new job. You know, like, what are you doing? Like, you should have something more to offer than that if you are a healthcare provider, in my opinion. 
Um, so we can talk about what that is. We can brainstorm what that is. If you're a fitness professional, let's talk about all of the benefits of fitness other than weight loss. Let's talk about all of the benefits of mental health care other than weight loss. Let's talk about, you know, like, let's start getting into what is actually your value add. I get that people think that weight loss is a fast, easy marketing solution. And to some extent it is because you are preying on people's insecurity and you are preying upon oppression, all these things. Like I get that weight loss sells, but you got to dig a little deeper, like, okay, let's like divest from selling something that's like bottom line problematic and oppressive to people and start thinking about what positive value do I have to offer the world other than preying on people's insecurities and preying upon oppressive fat phobic systems? Like if you don't have an answer to that question, we have bigger problems than marketing, you know? So that's my short answer. <laughs> oh my God. I am in awe of you right now. The, the, the <laughs> podcast listeners don't have the benefit of having watched my face as I just fell in love with you. <laughs> um, you just said so point. many of the things that I think, but I, I'll be honest as a, as a practitioner, as a passive consumer of those people's content, I, I think it, but I, 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 I'll be honest. I don't say it in a desire to not alienate potential people that I could have a positive influence on as practitioners sure. and as marketers and whatever. Uh, but, but, Oh, my heart just grew through. <laughs> I mean, and, and here's the thing is, is like everyone that I'm following, if I'm following somebody who sells weight loss or participates in fat phobia, it's because I'm willing to overlook that shit, even though I fucking hate it because they offer something really valuable that I think is good for the world. And I wish that they would just focus on that thing that yep. is actually valuable and is actually worthwhile and stop like kind of masking it with this like weight loss shit that is ultimately harmful and oppressive to people. You know, it's like, I think people sell themselves short by being like, oh, people only buy my stuff. If I sell weight loss, it's like, do you really have that little faith in what you do? And I hear this all the time from practitioners. They'll say to me, like, um, I, you know, I'm really, really, you know, uh, passionate about, doing trauma resolution work, but, you know, I originally got my start marketing people, marketing to people who do emotional eating, you know, stuff. And so I'm afraid if I, you know, actually make my weight neutral stance positive, I'll lose clients. And I'm like, sure, but you're doing the right thing. And if your trauma resolution stuff actually helps people, and if you can figure out how to sell that for the real value that it is, like you just, now you're like both in integrity and also making money. And I think if you can't figure out how to do that again, it's just like a bigger, it's a bigger issue. Like if you can't figure out how to make your money without doing harm, then we've got bigger fish to fry. I am so glad that you brought up this belief in oneself as a, as, as the, the real essential component here. Right. And I, you know, I think about it from my like businessy brain where it's like, okay, well, when have I made pivots in my business and how have I done it? And essentially what it is, is like, okay, let me get, you know, offering a, which for me was personal training, just pure straight up. Like I can help you move better. Let me get that stable to a point that I have steady revenue that, that covers my bases, right? My bases are now covered. And then shifting my content, my focus, my education, my messaging, my freebies, my everything to the new thing, while that pool is still keeping me stable. So I'm not firing all of my training clients. Yeah. I am just changing my externals so that I'm drawing in the people that are actually want well-being, coaching, and corporate workshops, and like all of that stuff while my bread and butter is still steady. Like we're not saying, you know, <laughs> fire everyone you're working with and destabilize your income. Right. Yeah. Like we're no. saying if you have something more of value to offer, and also some of us just have to be brave enough to change the game that we are all playing as practitioners and as human beings, Yeah, like we have more to offer as people than right. our relationship to gravity on this planet. Which yeah, is yeah, 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 yeah. Or totally. wait for anyone who missed that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's exactly. I mean, I just think like, you know, it, you know, you can change slowly, you can change quickly. You know, I think that like, however you change is really up to you and whatever pace you go, is it up to you? But at some point you do have to ask yourself the question, if what I'm doing is out of integrity with my ethics and values, how long can I realistically do it before I'm going to like really not be okay anymore, you know, and not feel good about myself. And this won't be worth doing. And it's like, I might as well just like, go get a job, you know, like, 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 
So I think routinely, well, that is honestly one of my pulse checks with myself is like, is this still better than having like a job? I, you know, like a jobby job. I'm like, yep, yeah, yeah. every time. <laughs> and I don't mean to put down jobs. That was not the point of that statement, but it's like, get out of my business, right? I might as well yeah. divest from my business. Like if my biz, if I can't be in business and be in integrity with myself ethically and from a values-based perspective, why the hell do I even run a business? You know, yeah. like what is even the point of that position? Like it would be a lot easier in many ways to have a nine to five job. So like if my business makes me kind of feel like, oh my gosh, I can't like, you know, in all honesty, put my head on the pillow without feeling like I'm low key doing harm. That's not okay. You know, <laughs> like, which I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I think, in the any issue of the roles. Is, I think the issue is a lot of people don't realize that they're doing harm. I mean, that's the biggest issue is a lot of people don't realize that they're doing harm and they don't even really want to have the conversation to learn about how they're doing harm because they're scared of what it will mean. Because I think if a lot of people knew this information, they they wouldn't be able to put their head on the pillow anymore. Like if they really understood what we understand, they would have to make these changes. And so I, I think a lot of people actually avoid the converse, avoid having an honest conversation about fat phobia in healthcare um, because they don't want to disrupt their business. And if they knew it would be making that decision between either disrupting my business or like not being able to sleep at night because of my guilt. Which you let's know? call that out all the way is a, the very definition of privilege. Yeah, totally. Totally. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's like, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to see that. I and wanna... I don't have to, cause I'm the beneficiary of this current system. Exactly. Exactly. And I don't have to. So, yeah. So, I mean, it really is, I think like anyone who's even listening to this, if you're still listening to this conversation, <laughs> which I bet you are, yeah. Right. Right. You're already ahead of the game in terms of your like brownie points for like being open to actually making a better world out there, even if it means inconveniencing yourself for like half a second, you know? So uh, let's talk directly to those people then, because, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm listening to this conversation. I understand now what they're talking about, or it's just dawned upon me like, holy shit, I, I am part of the problem in that I was raised in this, in this environment. And I'm just now coming to understand it. Like, what does one do with that? Right. Because they're, if we're in the system, we're of the system, how do we move forward and dismantling the, well, the, the issues here? I mean, the first step is really taking inventory of my business, including my marketing, but also my actual coaching practices and how I coach and how I work with people, whether that be, you know, in therapy or fitness or whatever the practice may be and, and being willing to uncover where the fat phobia exists, right? Where the weight normativity exists, where the thin is, where is the implied thin is good, fat is bad. Where does that exist in my marketing, how I actually work with people, how I talk to my clients or patients, et cetera. So that's like step one is just taking inventory of where the fat phobia is. And that's a huge undertaking in and of itself. That's like step one and requires a lot of self-education just to do that. It's like, where am I being racist requires learning about racism a lot and on the deep level, you know, and it's ongoing work. It keeps going forever. Um, so that's Can step one. You give an example, because I feel like we've, we've touched on the marketing thing. That's that one we've given a nice obvious one, but where might yeah. someone, and I don't mean this isn't just for coaches, right? This is also for people yeah. who listen to the show who are in coaching relationships and yep. may not even realize because, you know, after a lifetime of being a little bit bigger than a lot of other people, um, there are times where I didn't even realize what was making me uncomfortable or awkward or whatever about a dynamic. So can we get an example of something in the coaching practice that might come up that would so be an example of this? I think a really obvious one that comes like the most obvious example that comes to me is like more like diet cultural stuff, like villainization of foods and eating. Right. So, you know, good foods, bad foods, you know, like the way we talk about quote unquote overeating, I don't even use the term overeating. It's like over what eating it's kind of like overweight, um, our language, even around things like language, right? Language is another place to take inventory. Am I using the term overweight, right? Am I using the terms like obesity? Am I using pathological language that pathologizes people on the basis of size, right? So those are two examples of ways that I might be talking to my clients where I may not even realize that I am perpetuating 
um, fat phobic beliefs, like implied fat phobic beliefs that, you know, certain bodies are better than other bodies, um, or certain better, you know, bodies are more valuable than other bodies. So, yeah, I think that those, that's like a really, that would be like a really simple one is like, how am I talking about food with my clients? Because most healthcare providers will at some point talk about food or foods possible food will come up. Right. Um, especially, you know, depending on what you do, but if you work in fitness or nutrition in any way, obviously, um, and I think if you're, you know, being conscious of how you're talking about food, like the moral moralizing of food, um, in the context of weight specifically, rather than in the context of like, oh, if you eat that and you're allergic to it, it's a fact that you'll have like a, you know, allergic response. That's a lot. <laughs> if you have an elevated a one C sugar is not going to help that. Right. Like right, right. nothing to do with your weight, everything right. to do with your hormones. Exactly. Like there's lots, like, am I talking about nutrition and like factual context of how it's like, like specific health indicators that aren't weight in terms of how they affect health indicators that are not weight. Or is there this sort of like third party weight thing happening where I'm like low key implying or low key, you know, contributing to the implication that like eating such things, you know, e eating certain foods will, you know, make me thin or fat, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that then comes up for those of us who want to be doing service in this space is the clients who are, who aren't there, right? Like they do come into the relationship admitting like, yeah, I want to be, I want to be physically smaller. Oh, so I have a really great, so like number one, like you never impose your, your point. I never impose my point of view or my politics uh. on clients. Right. So it's like, my client wants to lose weight. That's up to them. I'm not going to participate in imposing like any kind of fat phobic view on them. Right. So like, I'm not going to, you know, participate in the fat phobia diet culture talk, but like if my client has, you know, fat phobia and diet culture, which by the way, they probably do like most people, that's not necessarily something I'm going to jump down their throats about unless they want help with it, mm -hmm. which by the way, you can ask about that. You can ask questions to figure out like, is their relationship with food something that they're comfortable with? Is that something that they want help with or not? If they're very clear, like, Hey, I want to lose weight. This is my goal. This is what I want. Like, I'm not interested in, you know, anything else. Um, then that's fine. That's totally up to them. Like body autonomy, their bodies, their, they get to do with their bodies, what they want. But I, the, where I go is a, I'm not participating in like moralizing that as a good thing by any stretch of the imagine. And I'm also not going to participate in any kind of lie that would lead them to believe that something I'm teaching them to do will help them accomplish that goal. When I know that that is not evidence-based. <laughs> like there is no diet or lifestyle change or anything that exists that is proven to create weight loss for people for more than a short-term period of time. And there's not a single wellness professional on the planet who can contest that. And if you think you can contest that, you need to go do your homework. Yeah. Um, go, go read so, a couple of meta analyses and then exactly. So like, I'm not, if a client, you know, in a land where, you know, obviously I work with people who want to work on this issue, they're coming to me. I'm in a little bit of a different position, but like, let's just say I was a fitness professional who, you know, was just sort of, you know, excited about fitness and wanted to do weight neutral. I had a weight neutral value system, but I was just a, you know, trainer who was working with the broad population of people and not necessarily people who wanted to do anti-diet work. I would just behave in a weight neutral way, focus on the benefits of fitness outside of weight loss. If a client came to me and said, I want to lose weight, I'd be like, that's totally cool. You do you. I'm just letting you know. I just need to be honest with you that nothing I'm saying to you, it can guarantee that result. And I don't think anyone else can guarantee that result for you either. <laughs> like, and then that person can go off and make a decision for themselves. That's part of the exactly. autonomy thing, right? Right. Like I'm always like, it's about sharing, being factually accurate with my clients, not about imposing my views. Yep. Yep. And the integrity of that. So yeah. one big thing that I wanted to talk about today, uh, cause I'm, oh, I'm mindful of our time, the video, there was a video that you posted to Instagram and it's what actually made me reach out and be like, oh my God, we have to get back in the mic. Yeah. Um, and you brought up, uh, and a topic near and dear to my heart because I have lived it. And it is the experience of the practitioner 
who feels like the way their body shows up in the world is somehow going to prevent them from being successful or is somehow going to make their clients uncomfortable. Um, mm-hmm. And I, if you'll indulge me, I'll tell the story a little bit, what I was telling you before we turn the mic on, which is I used to work for a big international well-known name in fitness that I don't say on the show, um, but I worked in one of their flagship locations and one year, you know, every year they do the like big corporate inspection where the big fucking boss is coming through to make sure everything is perfect. And, um, we of course like hid every little pimple while he was there. And then of course they would all come back out, but it came back down through the, through the ranks It eventually trickled the, the, the the details of the story eventually trickled out into the crew, though it wasn't immediate apparent, um, that the, female staff was not fit enough to look like our brand. And so our boss, we did not know this at the time that this is what was happening, but our boss invented this like whole series of like fitness Olympics for us to compete. And we loved it. We loved the competition and the the camaraderie and we had a really good time with it. And later on found out that it was a mechanism to get us to work all work out more so that we looked the way that we were supposed to look to be on that brand, which knowing that directly fits into all of my early career fears that I used to feel like I had to tell every potential client about my chronic illness so that they understood that there's a reason that I don't look like all the other trainers. It's because I'm actually like a really resilient, like chronic illness sufferer. And I'm really tough. And you totally want to work with me, please. Because I was like, well, I'm too fat to be a trainer. Oh, so that's I mean, my deal. That's why your video resonated with me so hard. I mean, you are so not alone. I mean, this story breaks my heart and it's so common. It's so sad. I mean, I just, I do not, this is like the one thing that really is just so painful. I think about, you know, anyone who is just interested in being a nutritionist and, or somebody who is just interested in being a fitness professional because they're passionate about the subject matter. It's like, it's like being an actor or being a celebrity, you know, there's like, it's like a job that so often the, the pressure is coming down to be thin. The fat phobia is so intense. And I just like, it really does break my heart. If you are working for a big company like that, you know, and, and I hope that we get to a time in the future where that kind of behavior is illegal. Like I really look forward to a time. I where- wonder if it is because it wasn't overtly. It's not illegal. Us. It's, it's not, not a, it's illegal. Oh, yeah, it's just no. disgusting. It is, it is completely legal to discriminate Arg. against people on the basis of size, except in Michigan. Oakland, California, I think there's like certain places in the United States where it is not legal, where, where, where size is a, what you go. Oh, go no, for. I meant that, like, I'm not sure that it's not illegal for this male executive to be commenting on the female bodies of his for like, sex down the chain for sexism reasons. Right. Like, I think that's actually the issue. I mean, yeah, that would be an interesting case if somebody tried to argue that it was a matter of sex discrimination. I mean, that would be a really, really interesting case. I mean, we hardly well, the ever. The bitch of it is, to honestly say, like, to totally go off on a tangent about this person or something, the bitch yeah. of it is, is that we had like the most senior group, tra- like, our trainers had the most combined experience and, and we were by the numbers the most successful group of trainers in the company at the time. We were fucking rock stars on paper. So it is complete bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. Like, well, and tangibly right. really helping people. Right, exactly. Like you're, I'm making more money for this company than anyone else. And you're going to tell me that I'm off brand because of my size. Like not sexy afraid. enough. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I think it would be, it's really interesting if they, uh, if somebody tried to bring upon like the sex discrimination component of it, I would be really curious to see how that went down. I actually think it would have a better chance in, yeah. in like the legal system of getting passed through and actually then screwing them, then trying to, you know, then going the size discrimination route, because which, at the moment, size discrimination is completely legal, except which, in certain, certain places. To bring it back around, essentially what we're talking about here is this feeling that either out of fat phobia, because you're on like a larger size and you're afraid that people will perceive you as not knowledgeable or we're talking about a, you know, a a different shape of body feeling like, oh, I can't work in this space because people of all sizes won't see me as weight neutral because I am what other people perceive as healthy or thin. 
Right. right? And, and how does it that we as a coach or right. a trainer, our physical vessel impacts our business? And what does that look like? I mean, I think by and large, you know, thin trainers, practitioners of all kinds are always going to have a significant advantage in a fat phobic culture where most people are trying to become thinner and see that as the ideal. I think when you're working in the disordered eating space or when you're working in the body positive space, there is what I would call like a somewhat healthy concern that, you know, people have, I hear a lot, like, why would people listen to me as a thin person talk about fat phobia and talk about weight discrimination, which to some extent is a legitimate concern. Do you know what I mean? Like they're sort of acknowledging that they don't actually have lived experience to understand something. Um, I think of course there are spaces for, you know, thin people in to act as weight neutral practitioners, right? You don't necessarily need to understand on a lived experience level, the, you know, what it's like to be a fat person in order to make the decision that you're going to make, you know, have a weight neutral practice, right? I think everyone should have a weight neutral practice regardless of their lived experience. Um, but yeah, like I definitely hear sometimes from thin practitioners, there's this concern, like, why would anyone listen to me talk about the danger? of fat phobia when I'm in a thin body. And there's sort of like, sort of like this dual issue where on the one hand, like, I'm glad that they're acknowledging their privilege and they're acknowledging that they don't understand what it's like and they don't know everything and they never will probably unless their status changes. And on the other side, there's so little education around this. We need everyone screaming from the rooftops about this topic. Like, I don't care what size you are. Like, I want you on our team. Um, and so. Yeah. Well, and to me, there's also this element that I, you know, if, if I akin it to racial forms of discrimination, um, there is to me, what sounds like the white fragility argument, right? That it, for white people to change their views on race, it requires other white people to go, Hey, totally. this is why that you are just mistaken, my friend. Right. Uh, it's allyship. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. It's allies. There's room for allies. We actually need allies. I mean, that's certainly, you know, how I view my own work, you know, like I am aware of where I know where my ability to, you know, be of help to someone is just by virtue of the fact that I don't have the shared lived experience. I'll never be able to say to a client who's larger bodied, Oh, I know exactly what you're going through. And let me tell you how to handle it. Like that's not something I can do or will ever do, but I do, you know, I think that there is there's lots of, I know that there are also lots of people who will listen to me because of the privilege that I have. And that's something that I, you know, it just kind of is what it is. And I'm going to use that privilege for good rather than evil, you know? And so I think that really is sort of, you know, kind of this whole concept of like, it is what it is, regardless of what your body size is, you know, use it for good rather than evil. You know what I mean? Like whatever your status is, whatever your, your lived experience is, try to use your own lived experience and your own status for making the world a better place rather than a worse place. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I also want to button back and just say, you know, not just about body size, but really anytime a client unpacks something for me, that's difficult. My default response it, and, and honestly, not just clients, like people in my life is, is almost never if they're just very rarely to be like, oh yeah, I know exactly how you feel because right. I don't, right. I haven't been there and exactly. to respond with the, you know, with, Hey, I may not know how that feels, but I have compassion that what I think I hear is X, Y, Z. Yes. Because I'm not going to know, even if they were, even if they were six feet tall, exactly 208 pounds, like I still have no idea what the fuck is going on for them. Exactly. And that's something that I often tell people too, as well as like, you know, no matter what your status is, no matter what your identity is, you're always going to be potentially working with clients who are, you know, have a different lived experience or, or more marginalized than you are in some way. Right. And so I think that that's, you know, learning how to work with clients who have a different lived experience and who may be more marginalized than you in one way or another. That's like part of the job description. That's why you get training to learn how to work with people in different identities, because no matter who you are, you're probably going to be in that position if you have more than like a handful of clients. Right. So 
that's like a big part of what we do at the center for weight neutral coaching is actually, you know, it's a huge part of the training is like working with people of vast different, you know, identities without doing harm. <laughs> like, yeah, um, first being able do to, no harm, including psychological harm, right? Like being able to work with a variety of different people from a position of privilege, because most people, even if you're a larger bodied person, if you're cisgendered, if you're white, I mean, you know, the list goes on and on, you're probably going to have privilege privilege somewhere. And if you have a client who has a different identity than you, you need to be able to work with that in a way that is respectful and in a way that is non harmful. And that's a big, big part of, yeah, that's a big part of what we do in our training, which is an excellent plug for your training. Uh, for those Thank who you. are interested, weightneutralcoaching.com. We'll link it in the show notes. Where else can people find you in your work? So, um, I mean, my primary, uh, Isabel Fox and Duke.com. If you go to Isabel Fox and Duke.com, I mean, you probably know this about me. I got my start link blogging in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Link in the show notes. I got my start blogging, you know, over a decade ago now. Um, and my blog, I think is like a really easy for lack of a better word, binge worthy blog. If you're interested in just sort of getting the cliff notes on health at every size, <laughs> you know, the sort of you know, to if you're into yeah. that sort of thing, if you made if it this long in this episode, we know that you're into that sort of thing. Yeah, if you want, if you want some, I would definitely go to IsabelFoxandJake.com and just start reading some stuff. You know, you're going to learn some things. You'll learn them quickly. I cut to the chase in my blogs. Oh, because uh, you don't do it when you're talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, exactly. I'm very you just cut to the chase in your existence. <laughs> yeah, thank and you. And I love that about you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank, thank you, you so much for round two. I have zero doubts that there will be a round three someday. Woo! Uh, and, and thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Darlene.